Hey everyone, my name is Donna Shiver. I'm the Programs Coordinator for the Booth Western Art Museum in Cartersville, Georgia. And I'm here at the Downtown Gallery today with Melissa Tanner, the manager of the gallery. We are highlighting works of art on display now for the Summer 2023 exhibit. Beautiful works. We want to invite everyone to come on down and see these pieces. And Melissa, here you go. Please talk <laughs> to us about the exhibit. Okay, and, uh, yes. Let's well, get folks in. this is our summer exhibit, like you said, and it will run through the end of August and we'll do it again. But this is great. I mean, we have something like elephants, we have uh, foxes, we have waterfalls, we have still lice, we have toys, we have so many objects and uh, different subject matter. So we've got something for everyone. But, and I also want to take a, a moment to uh, give a huge shout out to all my photographers and artists. Mm -hmm. They are fantastic. They always show up every time we call for art. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the photographers, I mean, are great. They're great people to work with. And they're always uh, exciting. And they're always um, just, um, pleasant to I mean they're just great people so I just really wanted to take this time on this exhibit to give a shout out to all of our guilds so it's fantastic and uh, I've enjoyed it so much and we have a web page it is downtown gallery at boothmuseum.org and we also have a Facebook page downtown gallery Cartersville Georgia so you will see you know you get to see the works online also it's a wonderful show. Mm -hmm. We definitely want to get you folks down here. As Melissa says, mm -hmm. so many things for you to see and enjoy. Thanks for watching. We're here at the Downtown Gallery, and this is Kathy Garrison, and this is her incredible painting, her still life that is entitled Teapots with Rabbit Figurine. So, Kathy, I love this piece for just the objects that you have here. We talked about the idea that this reminds me of some of those Dutch Baroque still lifes with the precious objects. And so I would just love to hear your story about any of your pots that you have here. And of course, the little rabbits, the, the, the figurines that you have here. What's kind of a, a story or background do you have for right. these? Well, growing up, mm -hmm. I loved the teapots my mother had. She right. had two special ones sitting on the counter between the kitchen and the dining room. And I was oh, always enjoying those. And one of them, when you pick it up, it would play tea for two. Oh, little music funny. box inside. That's so wonderful. I always loved those just as a little girl, you know. And I, I have that teapot. It doesn't play music anymore. But um, I think that's what inspired me to start collecting teapots. Ah. And so we travel a good bit. Mm -hmm. I always try to find an antique mall or even flea markets. You can find They're teapots. So much fun. Yes, love them. And so I have quite the collection of teapots. And my husband teases me and tells everybody she has more teapots than she'll live to paint. It's and that's like probably tea. true, yeah. you know. So that's kind of what got me started with that. Mm -hmm. But initially, when I would uh, paint, uh, I painted a lot of landscapes in the beginning. But I was in a gallery. In, not in the gallery, but a touring a gallery in San Antonio. Right. And it was a lot of Western art, mm -hmm. but I was drawn to all the still lifes that were in there. So I really started painting more still lifes at that point because they were so beautiful. So you were inspired by those still lifes and that, that prompted you to want yes. to create your own. And yes. so when you assemble your still life, what are you thinking about in terms of like your arrangement and you know, color or height or any of that kind of right. thing? Right. Well, you know, from just what little I've studied art, mm -hmm. um, I know that you need to have angles sometimes like, you know, and up you like do. this. You have such a lovely to sit. You right. Know, you, if I were to read this from left to right going across, I, yeah. I can see that you've got this lovely line that comes right across with your, this is a chest in the yes. background? Yes, yes, it's a chest that and I this have. This lovely line that comes down this way. Right, right. And, um, so I think I said this was my mother's here. Uh -huh. Glass jar there was hers. Mm -hmm. And I just set it up and I rearrange a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. I put it here and it, sometimes it can take a long time just to arrange it. It really does. And you're running all over the house to find your teapots that look the best mm -hmm. in that arrangement. So Absolutely. take some time. And so I was talking to you before about this pot in particular mm -hmm. and that lovely little bird that you painted right mm -hmm. there. So 
this this particular pot you were saying this this belonged to your mother is this uh is, did you re that, did you get this at one of your during one of your collections? yes yes okay. that yeah both of those mm -hmm. at some point i wish i could remember where i bought each piece but i don't re always remember where i bought them but i really did love that one and it, it had the pot. little bird and uh, I, I first paint it you know just an off-white and then i start glazing it so uh -huh. the pattern is glazed on there well, that's Rather really than. interesting to me, too, because you're glazing on these different colors, and mm -hmm. so you're using thin layers of paint versus the thicker, more right. pasta style painting. Yes, that's yes. Really, that's really interesting to me, because that takes a, that takes a long time. It time. does. You have to let it dry you for do. a good while, and people will ask me, well, how long did it take you to paint this? And there's no way I can answer that question. <laughs> well, there's, this, there's assembling all the pieces and mm -hmm. thinking about this is, this is the sweet spot, this is what I like. Right. right? And then you, you lay your paints out and you start that, that process of you know, thinking about blocking in shapes and, and how yes. you're going to compose it on your canvas. And then you've right. got all that glazing that comes yes. on top of it. Yes. So this is, this is and a, there's the lighting. The lighting. Mm -hmm. You have to keep working with your lighting to get the best uh, angle and the shadows going and all. Mm -hmm. And you do have and, uh, a lovely, just a lovely shadow that cuts through right here, it looks like, and it really does emphasize this structure on your teapot. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to accomplish. So just thank a you. <laughs> focal point right here. Thank you. And your rabbits? Yeah, well, I, I love rabbits. You know, I have paintings of rabbits that other people have done. Okay. And then I said I would be shopping again with mm -hmm. my husband on the trips, uh -huh. and I would find rabbit figurines. So I have several of those. And I, I read that a lot of times a painting can benefit from some form of life, mm -hmm. even though it's not a live rabbit, but it represents some life in the leaves there. Mm -hmm. I put those just to represent some life. The leaves are beautiful. And of course, if they were real bunnies, they wouldn't sit still. No, they would anyway, not. Right? So there you go. That's right, they would not. Well, thank you for sharing all, some of your process with regard to your painting here. It's a lovely, lovely piece. Thank you. We appreciate your conversation and congratulations on being in the show. Thank you, I appreciate you having me. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth Mobley, right here with us in the downtown gallery. This is her glass piece here and it's called Coastal Cool Clear. Love this work because it's such an interesting medium in and of itself. So I'd love to you for you to explain some of your process to us. Talk about some of the things that you and I mentioned before, that idea of the, the different size of glass and how you have your I think you said you have your glass already with pigment you know, in the glass and you can work that way. So that talk to me about this and I love the triptych of course. Okay. Um, so I like to work with fused glass, mm -hmm. which means it goes into the kiln just like pottery. Mm -hmm. And this, these three pieces are uh, something that reminds me of when I was growing up. I grew up in Pensacola, Florida. And that was in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So there was a time when you could go to the beach. That's true. And there was nothing but the ocean. Mm -hmm. So um, I call this one coastal, cool, and clear because it's coastal because if you look from a distance, you don't see anything else but the ocean. And if you look to the left, you don't see anything protruding or no obstructions mm -hmm. it's just white sand and ocean and it's the same on the right side mm -hmm. so um, that's why I call this first one coastal and cool is because you know you're at the beach it's hot it's beating mm -hmm. down on you so you want to go out to the ocean and start cooling down a little bit and then you get a little bit tempted to go in further and when you go a little bit further you could actually start seeing the ocean floor so you look at the floor, it's white sand, white sugar sand at the bottom, and you can also see the movement of the water itself. Which so, is beautiful. Right, yes. So that's where I got my inspiration from uh -huh. the uh, beach in Florida. So glass, okay. it's really interesting because I actually started with stained glass, and then I oh. want to incorporate fused glass mm -hmm. because I started getting bored with stained glass, but I liked it. I like just about any kind of glass. And um, I started learning just about anything that I can learn about fusing glass. And I did, uh, I've done uh, 
blowing, glass blowing, torch work, all kinds of glass. And then I'm like, well, I can't learn everything and I will never learn everything. So I decided I will focus on kiln fused glass. Um, so I learned that glass is expensive and you don't want to just melt it and figure it out later. So one of the things that I do is I do a lot of testing. So I can test for colors, the uh -huh. choice of colors that I pick. Now, with fused glass, there's a lot of times there's pigment already in the glass. Mm -hmm. But I can figure out which glasses looks better with other colors and which one does not react with other colors. Some of my favorite colors is, of course, the ocean colors, blues and those colors. But I also like working with clear because you can do a lot with clear. And I remember you said something about laying, you lay your colors down in such a way so that, correct me if I'm wrong, you said something about laying clear on top of it and that, that creates some difference yes. between your colors. Right. And we were talking about, correct me if I'm wrong again, were we talking about these, these colors here, this white strip that runs across yes. this band? Well, all three pieces have, it does have clear there are two or three layers in this. Uh -huh. The first layer is a, a white, uh, white base, and it's, uh, okay. it is opaque. And so the other thing I've done is I've taken fine glass, mm -hmm. and it could be in either of these colors, and I can use different grits. So this is a coarse, this is a medium, this is a Core, it goes medium to fine so that you can get that depth. Wow. And that's another thing that I love about glass is you can get depth in glass. And yeah, this, this line is, is so effective with not only sort of uh, helping us understand that you have larger fragments, I guess, pieces of glass through here, but it does give that sense of depth, you know, that idea that it's going off into the distance. Right. It's, really, it's really a beautiful piece. And the difference in, in sort of the coloration, more subtle shifts of color, even in that white, yes, uh, is really beautiful. So, so did you say something about um, working with stained glass before, am I correct? Yes, that was and, a long time ago. So how long have you been working with fused glass? I've been working with, with fused glass since 2007. Mm -hmm. I was doing stained glass the first two years, 2005-2007. And so the transition between one to the other, what was that like? It was different. One of the things that I liked about stained glass is that I learned how to cut. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing stained glass, you also have to be very accurate. Oh. When you're working with fused glass, you can have a little bit more flexibility because depending on how thick your glass is, you can actually get them to, to do what you want and have some gaps or less gaps with stained glass. You want them to be almost exact shape because you don't want really big pieces of silver or the the solder. So um, I've been doing fused glass for a long time. And you were talking about clear glass. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I used different kinds of uh, grit, okay. whether it's coarse, medium, or fine. Okay. And this is clear. And one of the things that I do is I think about the process of how I'm going to get the effect that I want. Okay. So for this one, what I did is I took the fine, medium, or coarse, and I sprinkled it on. And then I backed it up with clear so that when it melts, it doesn't just go flat. So that's how you get those little pebbly-looking things. So that helps to, in some ways, keep, keep it the shape. in place. Right, keep the shape keep in the the place. Shape. And then... I did another layer, and you could see that there's a little bit more opaque, right. more white. If I put clear on top of it, the things behind it that I'm putting on top of it kind of pushes those colors back. Understood. So whatever is on top is more apparent. Gotcha. Very interesting process. So thank you so much for sharing some of your knowledge about fused glass Thank today. You. I want to congratulate you on being in the show, Elizabeth. This is a really stunning piece. I love the colors in this, and I love just that, the abstract shapes and, you know, uh, just the simplicity of it. Thank it's you. It's really beautiful. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Good job.
I'm here with Kelly Langham. Yes. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I want to look at your piece here, and we're we're looking at Out of the Shadows. This is an acrylic work, am I correct? That is correct. And a beautiful horse. Thank you. Um, and we talked about this before the recording started today. And you were talking to me about being a contemporary painter, I mm -hmm. believe. And you love this sort of this size for this horse because horses are quite large, of course. And I think that you were talking to me about the idea that you began a series of paintings of horses after a commission or two commissions. Yes. So I, can you talk to us about your process? Absolutely. So a great friend of mine uh -huh. um, called me and asked me if I could paint a couple horses as a gift to someone who had lost two of theirs. Okay. And I had painted animals before, but never a horse. Um, I am drawn to them. I think they kind of come fairly easy to me to capture the image. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, horses were something new. Now, his horses were much smaller because uh, he was getting two, and he just wanted kind of from the neck up. Okay. So it was a little bit different um, as far as composition goes. But sure. I never knew how much I loved painting them until I started painting them. Mm -hmm. And I think the main reason is, is because I realized um, that they're so powerful and peaceful at the same time. And, you know, I've seen horses a few times in my life. I've ridden one once, mm -hmm. but um, maybe I forgot about that um, until I was actually doing it. And I, I just fell in love with it. So, mm -hmm. so I started a series after that. Um, this is the fourth. And uh, one lives in Milton, Georgia now, and one lives in Denver, Colorado. Um, but I just, like I said, they're so powerful, but I also think that they're such a statement piece. Um, and whether you're male or female, you can both be drawn to it, you know, as far as when one is in your home, you don't feel like it's too masculine or too feminine. You don't have to love horses or have ever had a horse to appreciate just what a statement they make. And, and so there was lots of reasons why I loved painting them, but um, I felt connected to them once I started. Right, right. I understand what you're saying because the structure of a horse is, is just really majestic mm -hmm. in many ways. There's, there's a beauty to them. There's such a strength to them, like you say. They have an impactful sort of um, look so oftentimes the expression that they carry. The, the, we, we were talking before about how you connect with sort of that idea of the eye when you're creating a portrait of a horse. Definitely. Um, you know, I sketch everything out, mm -hmm. but the eye is what I have to get right immediately. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like I've, I've connected with mm -hmm. it. And, you know, you, you understand them and their soul and everything else once the eye is done, then the rest all falls in place. So that's right. very important to me. Right. It's a beautiful painting, and you were talking about the mane on this horse. Love the brush strokes. I mean, we've got some really just beautiful uh, brushy marks here, um, you know, suggestion. Nice, confident mark making, you know, so it's it's not overstated. We know what this, what this horse looks like in terms of the structure, but you've done it in such a very beautiful, you know, just simplified almost way. It's, it's, so it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful craftsmanship of the structure under here. Just love it. And then the, the main, you said it's darker on the other side. Yeah, so How something that kind of captured um, my attention when I first saw this horse, I saw it on Instagram. I was just searching and this horse came up and I was like, wow, it, it was so unique. It has such a white mane. Um, and then on the other side of it, which you cannot see, it is pitch black. So the mane goes from stark white to pitch mm. black. And then, of course, with this coloring, it was just such a contrast and so different. Uh, and I just thought it was so beautiful. It is. That is interesting. It sounds like you have another painting that you need to Yeah, perhaps. right? This, Maybe this, we'll get to see this, the other side. The, the other side. <laughs> the other side of the horse. That's right. Very nice. Well, Congratulations on being in the show, Kelly. Thanks. Thank you for speaking with us. Beautiful piece. Yeah, Wonderful. thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Janet Klucke, very nice to meet you today here at the Downtown Gallery. We're looking at your piece, Looking Both Ways. Mm -hmm. Love this piece for a lot of reasons. It's uh, so interesting to me, the the composition that you have here and how you, the horses, did, was this, was this purely just, this happened, this, the horses in different directions. I wish. That... Well, it, in my reference photo, so I always use reference photos okay. when I'm painting, and of course from life. Okay. Um, but I there was a lot of distractions in the photo, so I decided mm -hmm. to get rid of everything. It mm -hmm. was too distracting, and I felt it was more powerful just to have the mare and the foal, 
-hmm. And there's so many, I feel like it conveys a stronger feeling. Okay. There's so many ways you can look at it. It's just enjoying them in the valley or they're relaxed or looking both ways on alert. Uh -huh. So there's, there's different, you know, ways you can look at it. Of course, of course. I love the, I love the idea that when I look at this, and if I, again, reading it from left to right, I can see, I can kind of run along the back of the horse, mm -hmm. the, the pale color horse, follow that along, follow the head down to the, to the muzzle, come back up, come back down, the tail, the, the leg. Uh, love the foliage that kind of, that, that leg that disappears in there, that uh, lost and found sort of form there. Come back around, lead back up, you know, it just keeps winding me back around. Mm -hmm. So lovely in terms of the way the forms are there. So if, you know, wonderful uh, choice, I think, on your part. Thank and then you. the palette, of course, is really nice. It sort of delineates the form and it's a lovely, looks like it's a lovely spring or summer day. So can't go wrong there. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, just, uh, that, and the title in, in and of itself, I, I agree with you, it has such a, a wonderful, um, you know, it leaves me wondering, looking both ways, uh, you know, are they, mm -hmm. are they, you know, somehow looking out for each other? Yeah, Just absolutely. really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's an oil painting. It's it? correct, yes. Very nice, very lovely. Love your framework as well. Even the, as I mentioned to you, that even the, the bit that comes around that frames your, your piece has that lovely red that we see in yes. the bowl. And the difference between the two, the paler horse, um, the contrast, right, mm -hmm. uh, between the paler horse and that red, that red's really coming to the foreground. Yes, and I try to like put my colors, mm -hmm. like a little bit of purples in the foreground and mm -hmm. vice versa, so they all kind of pull together. Yeah. And I like to push my colors way more than any photo, because as you know, photos lose so yeah. much. Yep. They lose so much color, uh -huh. and I like to push it even further. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's really nice because I was asking you before, did you have the opportunity to, to sort of see these horses in person, do any mm -hmm. color studies in person, that kind of thing. Um, so really lovely in terms of the color choices that you made for the foal. And you, you do see some of these wonderful um, sort of pink leaning towards some just bits of that red that, that's in there. And you've got some of that pink in the bowl itself. So it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Thank you. I want to congratulate you on being in the show. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for, for having me. With us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Sonizer, so happy to meet you here at the Downtown Gallery today. Looking at your photograph here, beautiful piece, Mountain House. Yes. Um, I think that you mentioned to me that this is, the location is Iceland. Yes, correct. And some sort of a fishing <coughs> village. Right. So, and it was taken in a place called the Snephilus Peninsula, wow. which is about two hours north of Reykjavik. I'd have to practice that one. Yes. <laughs> Don't ask me to spell it, though. <laughs> um, and it was a series of fishing villages, mm -hmm. and this one is a fishing village called um, Arnestapol, and it's at the foot of, um, you know, as you can see, the mountains, um, yeah. Mount Stapoli. Those are beautiful and, um, mountains. I was just drawn to it because it seems so isolated. And then, of course, the difference in the colors, you know, the green rolling hills, the, the lava down here. There's a gorge in front of us. Well, that's so interesting. The <laughs> landscape, the topography in and of itself is just really interesting. We talked before about the directional sort of shifts of the flowing grasses that you have here. And, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing image. Did you mention it was a trading post at one time? It was a trading post at one time. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure when, but um, you know, I could kind of see people, you uh -huh. know, uh, visiting, you uh -huh. know, and coming up from the from the water, sure. you know, perhaps, and um, you know, and doing their trading there. And um, I believe people used to live there as well. And wow. um, you know, it's kind of interesting to imagine what life must have been like. Um, this was taken in October, the 1st of October. Okay. So, of course, there's still snow in the mountains, <clears throat> or maybe it's new snow. Um, but I, it's hard to, for me to imagine what it must be like in the winter <clears throat> in right. Iceland. Right. I'm sure it's cold. I'm sure it's cold, and perhaps it's all snowy. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. We're talking also about, this is such an education in, in that, in the sort of the, the, the shifts of white. And yes. And what white can, how it can... Uh, how it can look when it's next to one color or another. So this is this structure, this trading post, uh, what the structure that used to be a trading post. Right, right. Such a warm white. Yes. By comparison with your skyline, the snow on the mountains, and just love this little strip, these little strips of white that are cascading down that sort of slopey right. um, 
hillside there. Right. Such a beautiful, right. beautiful, beautiful And, and there piece. were just thousands of waterfalls in Iceland. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I, I didn't blow it up to see if there's waterfalls back in there or wow. back in there. But um, very possibly, that you know, there were just waterfalls in. But I could go back to the, to the file and, you know, kind of look to see if, you know, there's water cascading down there also. Um, but it was just, you know, pretty magical. It's a different place, Iceland. Well, I guess it's very, was it very quiet? It was area? very quiet and it's not very populated. Right. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we saw a couple of boats down here okay. in the water, but, um, but not much, you know, and, and that was kind of like the whole country you know, was not a whole lot of people around. You feel like you're the only person in the world when you go there? Uh, kind of, you know. It must be an interesting place to live, to grow up, and like I said, to spend the winter. Uh, but I do like, I like the whites. I like uh -huh. the way that the white of the house contrasts with the white of the snow. And then of course, you know, it was an overcast day, no uh -huh. blue skies, but even the white in the sky, you know, you can see it's differentiated from the white snow in the mountains. It is, it's such an education in white. <laughs> it's also an education in green. Yes, that's right. Because I yeah. love this, this Up here, sort of, um, and then medium olive sort of color green and then the fresh new green. Yes. Yes. They're coming in there. And even these golden colors. Right, right. right. Yeah, it's a beautiful, so. beautiful piece. And just the lay of the land, uh, very flowing, um, the sort of that very stable structure that's there. Right. Yes. Compositionally, you've got some sweet spots here. I mean, it's really nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was, um, you know, fun to take and, and fun to kind of put yourself there. Absolutely. I, think. I can imagine. I think I want to be there for sure. Yes, just, yes. It, it, I'd like to visit again. <laughs> just for at least yeah. a little bit. Yes, that's right. Maybe not in the winter, but... Maybe not. <laughs> yes. You can need skis. <laughs> yes, yes. Chris, thank you so much for talking with us today. Congratulations on being here. Thank you very much. This is an okay. honor for me. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Dahl, very pleased to meet you today here at the Downtown Gallery. We're looking at your photograph here, and I'm just you know, sort of in love with the colorations that I'm seeing in this one, flight and fort. So please talk to me about some of your processes in order that, that you that you used in order to achieve the layerings that you have here. Um, please okay. talk to us about that. Yeah, so basically uh, it's a photo composite. So mm -hmm. there are two of my photos in it. The okay. uh, fort is the background, originated as a black and white. Uh, that actually hung in the museum a few years ago. And then the uh, bird was captured in the Okefenokee Swamp, the forts down in Savannah, Georgia. Oh. So I put the uh, fort together as a black and white and didn't care for it. And I basically took it all apart, went back into Photoshop and used some filters in Photoshop okay. to create the uh, colorized version of the fort. So Photoshop has something called neural filters and gotcha. one of them is colorization. I went through two or three different variations until I found one that I liked. Then I went back into Photoshop and added the water mm -hmm. uh, so that I would get the color reflection in the water. And that was a, a process as well that, uh, that I found basically online. Mm -hmm. And then I composited the uh, bird and, and built the reflection of the bird to go with it. So. Really interesting. I love and your editing eye in terms of the color palette that you've chosen here for some, I mean, I love these these greens that go into sort of deeper greens that go into these um, these different sort of lighter shades and the lavender, the darker purples here really accent the bird beautifully. That heron is and the purples against I'm just gonna complimentary color way to go. Um, love the purple next to the the yellow that that's uh, on the I'm gonna say claws of the heron. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. Um, beautiful, beautiful uh, repeating patterns and forms in your in the depth of your fort, and I think it's really interesting some of the processes that you've used here to create. Uh, you know, you've juxtaposed two different things here to create this one piece. So it took, must have taken a good bit of time. It did, and there were uh, there were several variations that will never be shown in public. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, I, I went I through understand. several variations using the color tool to get. Right. the colors that look good to me right. um, and I'm not my wife has to match my clothes so I'm not a <laughs> okay. color person but well, I can that's a beautiful color I can tell you know what's pleasant and it, it all looked good to uh -huh. me and basically to get this color down here I just picked from one of these other blotches 
up uh -huh. here and, and brought it down. Did you sample? Mm -hmm. you, that's really cool. That's yeah. really cool. That, that helps you with um, that color harmony, right? It does. Uh, Photoshop Smart. has a lot Smart. of tools that you can use to, to kind of nudge that stuff along. So, uh, yeah, there are variations nobody will ever see, but uh, this one I ended up with and I liked, and, uh, and here it is. Well, I think that, again, that, that hair and the delineation of that form, and I love, you know, it's, it's, it's such a, we see that, that bright area through here mm -hmm. uh, in, in, you know, creating sort of the nuance of the form of the, the elongated neck, yep, the wingspan, yep. all of those beautiful things, and then just the subtlety of the wing that, you know, is pushed back, you know, uh, the contrast that, that you use there, those subtleties, they're just yeah. really beautiful. In real life, there was an alligator coming his way and oh, really? he was avoiding being lunch. I see. <laughs> so, well, good, good job. Let's, let's hear it for the alligator helping that here That's right. along the, the way. The alligator right? helped me. Very good. Well, it's just a, such an interesting um, process that you've used for this. I want to congratulate you on being in the show. Thank you so much for talking with us. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you wanting to talk about it. This is cool. Very right. good. Thank you again, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Howard Kaplan, I'm so happy to meet you here today. Nice I'm to going to look at your piece, this photograph. This is so much fun. Love this piece. Toy Stories is your title. Yes. And I love the color. I feel like this is just going to be such a fun piece for me to talk to you about right. in terms of color, but also shape, uh, the objects that, that are here. And you and I talked about this one before in terms of the idea that you were in Rouen, France. Correct. And you were, talk to, talk to us about the place where you were. Sure. Well, <clears throat> we were visiting Rouen with friends to see the cathedral. That's and right. our, on our way back from the cathedral to the train station, mm -hmm. we passed a shopping street. Okay. And had all these uh, small shops in the, and um, I was, the colors in the toy store caught my eye, and I took a minute and photographed the uh, toys in the window. Mm -hmm. But what I think what really uh, appealed to me was uh, the arrangement of the toys and the care that went into putting this display together. They're and, really and well organized. They're very well organized, and um, and also the whimsical, um, the ostrich and yeah, the other fun. toys he's around. Super it. fun. Yeah. He's super <laughs> fun. Um, it's such a such a caricature. Um, and and you know you mentioned the way that they're or, the, the way that they're arranged, and there is a real organization. And I suppose right. that that would it would make sense that you would have these arranged in such a way so that they're, you know, like objects are together and all of that kind of thing. Right. But the primary colors in this thing, they're just super fun. Right, right. And uh, the mix of colors is no. great, too. And, and, um, and that's what really stood out to me. I know. And this, yeah. this car back here, right. um, I mean, that's my color. That's right. Just, that, I love well, when it. I was a kid, Prussian blue and crayon right. was my favorite. Color. That's a, about the same color. I know it's such a strong <laughs> color, and the, those those blues really do stand out amongst them. And it's such right. a nice. I mean, the balance of it is really yes. nice with all the with all the red that's in there. You've got some green to kind of neutralize that. The blues kind of help with some of that too. And then you've got this really fun color, like this crazy purple that's back that's there, right. which is just kind of like a, uh, just all by itself. Right, and I think the boxes help too. They do, they and they're do. upside down. And right. I'm trying to read French. <laughs> it's all just a fun, it's just a fun, fun whimsical piece. Right. I had um, a lot of fun with it. I bet you did. I bet you did. You, let's see, you said something about uh, someone else composed it. You just well, I felt, I felt but, that um, but, okay, a lot of yeah. times with still lifes or a similar yeah. type, um, you spend a lot of time composing the picture, mm -hmm. but I felt that this was done for me by whoever did the window. Well, there's there's something to be said for that. <laughs> However, you had to you had to figure out what would work, right? Right. right. So well done. Great. Such a fun piece. Thank you for talking. I had with a lot us. of fun with it. Thanks yeah. a lot. Congratulations Appreciate on being in the show, Howard. Great. Thank you. All right.